let you know that both Kate and Michelle are under the weather today. It's the end of the semester. Everybody's worn out. Things are going around. Um, Kate's here. You can't see her, but um, she's she's out there in Zooland, so she's helping a lot and managing things. Um, and I am your um, sort of host for the afternoon. Um, the food is out there. It will still be out there when we're done. So um, if you want to pick up something on the way out, you can. If you didn't sign in on the way in, please try to do that on the way out. It's just for us to keep account of how many folks are here. I promise we're not going to call you and ask you for anything. We're just going to count. And, and if you put your name down, and I already did, I'll make sure we don't count twice. So I'm going to um, sit back and um, introduce Tom White. And Tom White is going to introduce our speaker. Um, our speaker will talk for a while, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. So enjoy your lunch and the talk. Take it away, Tom. Thank you, Celia. Welcome to everyone who is with us in person and virtually today. My name is Tom White. I am the coordinator of educational outreach at the Cohen Center. As we begin, please remember to silence your cell phones. And if you're joining us on Zoom, please keep your microphones muted. Today's event is entitled The Origins and Evolution of a Holocaust Center and a Small Public New England College. And it is part of our Cohen Conversation series. This year, the Cohen Center is marking our 40th anniversary. Our featured guest for today, Dr. Paul Vincent, is one of the center's former directors and the person who actually hired me all those years ago. <laughs> and he generously offered to host this conversation about the early days of the center itself. The presentation is based in part off an institutional history that he drafted during uh, 2018 to 2021, which is forthcoming in print. I think that many of you in our audience today already know Paul, but let me remind you about a few of his many credentials. Professor Emeritus Paul Vincent taught history and starting in 1998, Holocaust studies at King State College until his retirement in 2017. He directed the Mason Library from 1985 to 1994, and then, following the retirement of Chuck Hildebrandt, served as director of what had been renamed the Cohen Center for Holocaust Studies from 1998 to 2007. Dr. Vincent has published two books, was a fellow at the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies uh, from 2007 to 2008, and was a Fulbright Scholar at Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland in the spring of 2015. Professor Vincent continues to teach through King State College's call program, Cheshire Academy for Lifelong Learning. And so thank you very much for being with us today, Paul. And let me turn the floor over to you. Thank you. <laughs> I made some bad hires in my life. <laughs> so thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a true pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm I'm relatively convinced that uh, I'm not going to cover everything I promised I would cover. Uh, actually, when I put the slide together, I wasn't sure that I had the right title, and I'm so glad that it's not your best. So uh, I, I want to begin by reading uh, what's the first uh, a little more than a page of the preface, uh, which is the first preface, because I divided what I wrote into two parts. Uh, and the first part, uh, which is really going to be fundamentally what I talk about today, we'll, we'll be dealing with Chuck Hildebrandt. Uh, we're visitors, uh, tourists, prospective students, uh, candidates for a college position or, or otherwise. To stroll down Keene State College's Appian Way in 2019, that's when I wrote this, uh, one can imagine them pausing to look at the elegant tan structure adjoining the West Wing of the Mason Library. And if they had a remote understanding of either the importance of uh, the Holocaust or genocide, the question would likely arise, how is it that a relatively small state college in New Hampshire is home to a stunning facility devoted to the study of the Holocaust and genocide? I've been associated with Key State College in one role or another for 34 years. It's almost half my life. It's now more than half my life. Uh, Yet even following a prolonged relationship, 
I was in awe as I watched the new Cohen Center gradually take shape. Although closely involved with the center for many years, I remained bewildered at the improbability of such an institution existing at my little college. For this reason, I believe the story should be told, told while memories remain relatively fresh, and while at least some of those who were in keen at the creation uh, are, are available to share their memories. My friend and colleague, Dr. Sander Lee, uh, asked excitedly uh, early in my research process, if I were writing a biography of Chuck Hildebrand, uh, somewhat naively, as it turned out, uh, I responded, no, a history of the Cohen Center uh, or the, the Holocaust Research Center will be demanding enough. And while I knew him, there's a good deal I didn't know about Chuck. Uh, yet over recent months, again, writing in 2019, I've learned that writing about the center is in fact writing about Chuck. President Judith Sternick expressed it well in April of 1992, opening a special tribute event designed to honor Chuck. She welcomed guests by noting that they had come to celebrate a person and a place. While it is easy to do this, because at King State College, the Holocaust Center and Chuck Hildebrand are the same. So it must be said that while the bulk of what follows poses as a history of the Holocaust Center, uh, it might read at least until 1998 as the story of Chuck Hildebrand. Um, I want, while I'm, while I'm at it, uh, to thank <laughs> Rodney Obian for uh, the work he's doing on, on putting this manuscript into some accessible form for people. Um, Chuck was born in Canton, Ohio, in 1933, the year that Hitler came to power, uh, he uh, was born and raised in a mixed working class neighborhood, uh, ethnically mixed, uh, a neighborhood that had Jews and synagogues, uh, a neighborhood that had its share of anti-Semites, uh, a couple of whom were his parents, as I discovered from Judy, his wife. Uh, I, uh, I knew that uh, his father was, but she said, no, it, uh, it, was, it was both of his parents. Uh, the family was Christian. It was not Quaker. There are people that believe that Chuck was a Quaker. Uh, he said a lot about the Quakers uh, because he so admired them. Uh, but he never himself became a Quaker. Uh, I, I actually think that he didn't feel he was good enough, uh, which in, in hindsight, it seems ridiculous. Uh, he was, uh, he was always, always sensitive uh, to his uh, presumed inadequacy of being a non-Jew dealing with the Holocaust. Uh, and uh, there are moments that that pops up uh, in, uh, throughout the archives as I read them. Uh, he noted that he heard Hitler speak on the radio. He heard his speech. He heard his, his, uh, his, his, his raging remarks about Jews and other people. Uh, he is one of the, we often say that we're, we're, we're products of a generation and for better or for worse, we never escape that generation. Uh, he is kind of the exception to the rule. We used to have a survivor that would come to speak, uh, Stephen Louis, uh, who would remark that hatred is learned at the breakfast table uh, as a child. Uh, with Chuck, it was just the reverse. Somehow he heard these things, for example, on the street, he would hear that Hitler guy is a nasty fellow, but at least he's doing one good thing, taking care of the Jews. Uh, and Chuck revolted against that. Uh, and he felt that the best way for him to deal with this is to go into a study of sociology, try to find out how societies can move in evil directions or in good directions. Uh, and so he went off to Kent State uh, University, I'm not sure if it was college or university back in the early 50s, um, but uh, he got his undergraduate degree there. Uh, he ended up getting his master's degree there as well, spent some time in the Navy, then came back to Ohio State where he uh, took his PhD in sociology. Um, he was back at uh, Kent State uh, teaching as a professor until um, 1969, 
1969 is when he came to Key State College. Um, and that's a, 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 special, a special thing when I think of he went from one, one KS to another KS. He couldn't get away from Keene or Kent. Or Kent. Uh, he, he taught here from 69 uh, into the 70s. And by 79, Judy and I sat down and talked about this. He was really getting burned out. He was upset with his students. Uh, they weren't serious enough. They weren't doing the reading. They weren't writing well. For those who are students in the room, uh, you, can, you can go away thinking, well, they were the same 45 to 50 years ago. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, and you know, I, I know faculty that would say that. Um, but in any case, he was burned out. And his dean, uh, Stugoff, uh, this was a time when they had rotating deans. Uh, Stu was actually a professor of mathematics, uh, and he was in the dean's position. It was a temporary appointment in those days. And Stu recognized this issue. Uh, he'd gone through it himself, and uh, he was trying to figure out what to do. And a flyer was mailed to him. Uh, talking about an annual Holocaust conference in Philadelphia. It looked interesting, and he decided maybe this is the key, and this is this is before, uh, way before emails, uh, when we had little slots where you got your mail, <laughs> and he slipped it into to, to Chuck's uh, box, and Chuck saw it, and he was intrigued, came to Stu. He said, this really looks interesting, um, but I don't have the money to do this. Well, um, as I found out from uh, my friend and former colleague, Oakle Johnson, uh, Stu immediately shot back at him. I'm your dean. I have the money. You're going. <laughs> and, and so Chuck goes down to Philadelphia. And he is absolutely blown away. He meets all of these people, Jews and non-Jews alike, who are dedicated to understanding what happened. How did this happen? And the person who is the leading figure in this uh, is Franklin Littell. Franklin Littell, along with a guy named Hubert Locke, uh, had started what became known as the Annual Conference on the Holocaust in the Churches. And Chuck goes through what I, I think could only be described uh, for an evangelical as a born again experience, he, he is absolutely transformed. He has suddenly found his calling and that calling is the Holocaust. It becomes his lodestar. And he comes back to Keene and he, uh, he starts to read. And after a short period of time, he starts to think, you know, I need to create a resource center uh, here at Keene State College. Uh, this becomes a remarkable commitment uh, on his part. Uh, and so after about a year, and he's gone to a couple of more conferences when he finally determines this, uh, he, he, he goes back to the one in 1980, the one in 1981. And I think it's at, at that point he decides, you know, I've got to put in a sabbatical proposal uh, because I want to do this right. And so he, um, he gets his sabbatical uh, and he's determined uh, that there are three things he wants to come out of this. Uh, he wants to create a center. He wants to he, he wants to build a course dealing with the Holocaust, and he wants to become uh, not so much the expert, but the information source for the region for people who are interested in the Holocaust, and can people can come and talk to him. Uh, and. The proposal that he draws up is one where he's going to travel throughout the country and he's going to visit centers throughout the country. The proposal is, is approved. He'd never had a sabbatical. He'd been teaching since the 50s. He'd never had a sabbatical. And he points out in his proposal, I've never asked for a sabbatical because I love teaching and I've never had a reason that I felt was good enough to take a sabbatical. Not every faculty member feels that way. What a sabbatical proposal is that? Well, he said, now I'm kind of worn out in the classroom, and I have a good reason. So then he, how am I going to do this? How am I going to travel across the country? I don't have the money to do this. Uh, and he, 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 he prints up a flyer, 
and he walks up and down Main Street, and he walks into every shop, every store, and shows what he wants to do, and say, "I'm looking for, I'm looking for funding so I can make this trip." And he states on the flyer, "You know, if you donate to me, I'm going to put an honor roll up on the wall uh, so that people can see that you know Miller Brothers, Newton, or whoever I can talk about them, they're gone." Uh, gave gave nobody responded. Nobody gave him anything. So he wrote a letter and he sent it to 40 different churches in the area, uh, spelling out what he wanted to do uh, to priests and, 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 and ministers. And uh, he got back maybe three responses, none of whom gave him money, just said, boy, that's kind of a neat thing. So one person from the synagogue wrote him a check. Uh, I don't think it was very substantial. The synagogue asked him to come and speak about what he was going to do, and the synagogue wrote him another check, but he was way behind what he needed to do. And somebody mentioned the Whiting Foundation. The Whiting Foundation in Boston has given money uh, to faculty at Keene State College taking sabbaticals for years. So he wrote to them. He sent them a budget that was exact to the penny, and they sent him a check that was exact to the penny. And it was roughly $2,400. So he had the money to do what he wanted to do. So he has selected centers all over the country. And uh, he goes for eight weeks uh, to visit 16 different cities that have centers. And he does this by Greyhound. Eight weeks on a Greyhound traveling from New York to Dallas with places in between, to Los Angeles, to Vancouver, British Columbia, back to Montreal, and finally home. But I've just mentioned four places. There were 16 cities that he went to. Uh, he's on the bus, okay? He doesn't have very much money. He stays at, uh, he stays at YMCA's. He stays at cheap hotels, or he sleeps on the bus. He doesn't mind this. This, this, is, this is great. I can read. And by the way, his parents never had a car. So he grew up either walking, taking the bus, or riding a bicycle. And when they went someplace, they went by Greyhound. So this was part of his life. And before he went, he had developed a, a card file with the titles of all of these books that he had determined over the prior couple of years what needed to be in his center. So every time he got to a city, he would go to used bookstores and he would find titles and he would ship them back. And by the end of the eight weeks, he had shipped back 300 books. Those become the core of what's the Holocaust Resource Center in 1983. It, it, incredible, incredible, wonderful story. Um, now, when he gets back, he had thought he had spoken with the library director, uh, my predecessor, Ed Scott, and he thought he had gotten agreement for, from him that there would be space in the library and it was going to be a carol. If on this floor, just very close to where we're at here, there were faculty study carols that you could get for a semester if you had a project. Um, well, Chuck went, it, it ended up not being Ed, he went to another librarian who was in charge of signing the carols. And that person said, you can only have a carol for a semester. And he, even the carol wasn't large enough, uh, but he said that wouldn't work. And he said, I need a double carol. And he said, well, I could give you a double carol, but it'll have to be shared by another faculty member. And, and Chuck could get very hot under the collar. And this really made him angry, but he felt he had no other possibility uh, than to agree when um, the campus ministry house, which was on Madison Street, uh, offered him one of the bedrooms to have his uh, uh, Holocaust Resource Center. Uh, that area doesn't exist. Uh, the closest you'll come to it is uh, uh, the Madison Street Lounge. Uh, Madison Street was taken over by, by, by Key State College in the 1990s. Uh, so in any case, uh, 
he opened this in January of 1993 over at the campus ministry. Uh, the formal dedication uh, occurs on the 12th of April, 1993. So 12th of April this year, 1983, excuse me, was uh, the 40th anniversary. Now, meanwhile, he writes a really heated letter to uh, the Vice President for Academic Affairs, uh, Dick Gustafson, uh, saying that I, I've read what he wrote, I was promised space in the library and uh, I didn't get it. And Chuck believed that this should not be off campus. Uh, he wrote, there's no college that shouldn't have Holocaust, a Holocaust Center in this country. Okay. Institutions today are failing to deal with moral and ethical questions. I'm glad we can't say that anymore. Uh, it's just 40 years ago. Uh, education by itself is no guarantee that a Holocaust won't happen again. And all I have to do is study Nazi Germany to realize that was true. Um, so in any case, so uh, while not ideal, he, he, he got this other facility, um, Gus, we called him Gus, um, uh, got a hold of Ed Scott and said, you need to find space in the library. And ironically, in the letter that he wrote, he said, I want space on campus, any place, but the library. He was he was so angry. He didn't want to come back to this facility. Um, thank God he swallowed that particular principle of his. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, things would have been quite differently. Um, in any case, uh, Gus uh, saw to it that uh, he had space. And it was right out here. It was on this floor. There was a periodicals office over here. And uh, Ed Scott moved the periodicals office to the East Wing. This is called the West Wing. Uh, and, and that is where he was for one semester. Uh, after the one semester, uh, two of the carols were joined. And it was, it was actually a little larger than a, just a normal double carol. Uh, and that is where he moved then uh, for, for January of 1994. Uh, so that was a big change. That was where he was when I arrived in the summer of 85 uh, in, in this carol. Uh, now, in the, in the fall semester of 1994, uh, Walter Singer, uh, a refugee from Vienna, uh, came to him and gave him his passport uh, with a red letter J on it. And that became an incredibly treasured piece of the collection right from the outset. Uh, he offered his course that first spring. He wanted it to be a seminar, but over 30 students signed up. You can't have a seminar with 30 students. So he turned it into a 300 level uh, course uh, and that's what it remained. Uh, and it was called uh, Sociology of the Holocaust. Uh, now the growth, the growth of, of the, the center uh, is, is a, a fascinating reflection of, of him. Already in the spring of 1994, uh, the New Hampshire ch uh, chapter of Hadassah, this is a, 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 a Jewish women's organization that is devoted to, uh, to Jewish principles as reflected through the lives of, of, of Jewish women. Uh, they invited him over to Manchester, and uh, on the 31st of May, 1994, they commemorated uh, Chuck for the strength of his commitment to humanity and to the preservation of human rights, for his conviction that through education, such an event as the Holocaust will never happen again. Uh, I'm sure if that happens, I'll let me Let me quickly go through some of some of the things that can be related to his time here, um, beginning with uh, the growth uh, and, and impact of the center. Um, the Holocaust Center's first, what it was, it was, what it was called was Remember Kristallnacht, uh, was held in November of 1984. Uh, 
at the Keene Public Library. It's, right, it's kind of ironic that it was at the Keene Public Library this year for the first time, I think, since 1984. Uh, and it wasn't called Holocaust Remembrance. It was called Remember Kristallnacht. Remember Kristallnacht. We, we often talk about Chuck and say that, that his motto was to remember and to teach. And remember, remember, remember comes out in so much uh, of the archives. Uh, in addition to Chuck, uh, one of the speakers was uh, a fellow named Stephen Stu uh, uh, Skubik. Uh, he was a special agent uh, with the U.S. Army's Counterintelligence Corps, uh, who was assigned to investigate Nazi crimes. Uh, that must have been fascinating. Chuck at that, at that, that evening said, uh, he argues that the Holocaust was the crowning and colossal event of the 20th century, if not all centuries. Demonstrates again that the Holocaust is his lodestar here. Uh, now, in December of 84, Chuck recorded that the Holocaust Center uh, had had 341 visitors since January. He kept track of everybody who came in. And because the center was only open two hours a day, he didn't have an assistant. Uh, he could keep track of everybody. He also said that uh, it now had 600 volumes. So it had it's doubled the, the books since he opened it in January of 83. By 86, the center was bursting at the seams, uh, and it was removed to uh, Fisk Annex uh, in 1987 uh, without any controversy this time. <laughs> so uh, he moved. It was in the, the, the basement over in, in actually human resources, what was called personnel back in those days, was over there. And he was down in the basement there. Uh, a lot more space, but not quite as accessible as other places. Uh, that same year, Chuck finally got a course release, 1986-87. That's important. <laughs> he was teaching for over three years without a course release running this center, trying to run the center. Uh, and believe me, he was on the road all the time, talking to student groups, talking to other people, doing interviews, remarkable number of interviews. Uh, and at this time, a full load was four courses. So he was reduced to three courses uh, at this point. Um, 87, 80, or 86, 87 was also a time when uh, he received New Hampshire Humanities Council funding uh, with help from Sander Lee. They arranged uh, an ethical issues on the Holocaust series, uh, which by the way, was also held over at uh, Keene Public Library. Uh, and two of the speakers they, they got was uh, Philip Haley, uh, who really kind of became famous for the work that he did on La Chambon. Uh, and then a philosopher uh, named Burl Lang that, uh, um, that Chuck was very enamored of for good reason, uh, a, a really terrific man. Uh, by the summer of 88, the Holocaust Resource Center had 1,400 books and 3,000 periodical articles. I'd be amiss not to say something about that. Chuck went through magazines and newspapers and clipped articles, and he had them carefully arranged uh, in uh, filing cabinets in the office, um, something that we kind of purposely lost track of <laughs> after a while because uh, they were very difficult to deal with and the need for them was not as strong as time went by and things become more electronic. It became more electronic. Uh, in the fall of 1988, uh, Richard Horowitz, uh, 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 a Jewish man over in Manchester, uh, donated money to Chuck so that he could hire an assistant, part-time assistant, just a few hours, just a few hours a day but it meant that the center, which had been open for two hours, could now be open from 10 to four. And that was incredibly meaningful uh, uh, to Chuck to have that. Uh, uh, it's crucial to note that this center, when it, when it originated, it, it, it ran on a shoestring budget. Uh, a lot of the money came out of Chuck's pocket. Uh, he helped his assistants. He bought a lot of the books himself. 
Uh, he could be really tough, as I found out from Gus. They they were loggerheads when he was the the representative of the faculty union. Uh, he said there were times they really butted heads, and Chuck got very very angry about certain things. He also told me in that conversation, he said he and I disagreed on a number of things, but I always knew that we both had the best interests of the institution in part. And he added, and I couldn't say that about all of his colleagues. <laughs> and and uh, that was such a powerful thing to say. But despite that, he never asked for anything. Eleanor Vanderhagen said that she pushed him, she was, she was one of his colleagues, to, to ask for money for assistant, for other things. He said, you know, all I wanted was space on campus. They gave me a room. I have a telephone. I don't pay for the electricity. They put in the shelves. I'm happy. This is what I need. Um, people like that should live forever, huh? Mm -hmm. Because the next generation wants something <laughs> that he was not prepared to ask for. Um, Chuck introduced the first newsletter uh, in the fall of 1990. Um, it included a personal note from him. It included um, uh, a thanks to donors, and he would he would indicate who had been donating things. Uh, information on some of the acquisitions, maybe a short review of something. But also, and, and I was I, I was actually quite I was rather ashamed when I read this. He also had a column that was entitled "Assistance Note." He felt that the other person that was in that office with him had something to say, and he gave them a column in his newsletter. And I said, I was ashamed because I never did that for Anna. <laughs> so, um, and it, it, uh, it, just, it's, it's, it, it underscores his character and his recognition that I'm no longer just the face of the, of the center. So is this other person that's working for me. Um, there was a remodeling of this building in 1991-92, uh, and it led to a major change for the, for the center. Uh, there was an area on this floor down at the other wing that had a radio studio in it, and it had all sorts of equipment, and it, was not, it had not been used. Uh, I got here in 85, and it wasn't being used then, and it hadn't been used for a while. And so, so, so we took all of that out and we, we remodeled that area and we brought the center back to the library. So it was on the second floor in the other end. And it was just a remarkable change. Uh, uh, Chuck, uh, Chuck responded, we have four times the space as in our previous location. It, it was like heaven for him that he has such a lot of space. Uh, although there were moves to come, especially during the years that Anna and I uh, were in the center, I, I think this really this really committed the library as being the home uh, of where the Holocaust Center would be. Uh, in the spring of 1993, uh, at the point of the Holocaust Center's 10th anniversary, uh, the collection was up to 2,400, more than 2,400 uh, book volumes. So it's grown significantly in 10 years. Um, I think Chuck and so. Chuck's passion and his conviction uh, need to be mentioned um, because they come forth so profoundly. Uh, there was a student reporter from the Equinox who contacted him in February of 1985 regarding a new investigation uh, that the American government was committed to on the whereabouts of Joseph Mengele. Uh, if you don't know the name, just briefly, I tell you, he was a doctor at Auschwitz. Uh, he was he was he was known as the angel of death by a lot of people. Uh, he picked out people who were twins and did medical experiments on them. Most people that were that, that got his attention uh, ended up uh, either uh, being deformed or dying. And he had managed to get out of Nazi Germany, was living in, in uh, Latin America and South America someplace. He ultimately uh, 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 drowned, I think, in a lake in Brazil. Uh, but in any case, the, the student comes to talk to him and, and Chuck responds with, with anger uh, and, and embarrassment. He said, it's only when under pressure 
that our government will act. And now it's trying to clear itself of any accus ac accusations that it's not been uh, uh, forthcoming enough about investigating. Uh, a few months later in September, he had another interview. This was not uh, uh, for the student newspaper. He emphasized his commitment to teach. He states, and this will be interesting to some people today, textbooks have been written not to stir up children. The official history makes everything red, white, and blue safe. I think it's a malpractice of history. 85. Uh, an interview in March of 1987 by uh, uh, Stacy Milbauer, a uh, wonderful interview uh, that was in the uh, Sunday Telegraph. The author, the author Milbauer, wanted to understand why this sleepy little town in, in southwestern New Hampshire has a Holocaust center. And after this lengthy conversation with him, she ends it by saying, the center is in Keene because Hildebrandt is in Keene. Um, says a lot for him. Infuriated in 1989, when uh, Polish Carmelite monks, or uh, uh, nuns rather, uh, erect a cross outside of Auschwitz, uh, he wrote a guest editorial for Portsmouth's Herald newspaper. Uh, and he says, as a non-Jew, I feel compelled to say that perhaps Christians have already done quite enough at Auschwitz. Um, powerful condemnation. Uh, I actually happen to believe that in this case, Trump was wrong. And I think when he went there a few years later, he was able to distinguish better the small camp, the Stammlager, from what was the extermination camp. And most of the people who died in the Stammlager were Polish Catholics. Uh, not true for the bigger camp. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I think this was important. No issue riled him as much, however, as denial. Um, and this was true through the final years of his career. In a 1992 interview with the Equinox, he argued that by destroying the validity of the Holocaust, Deniers are killing six million people for a second time. Uh, first they died, he argued, now their memory is being destroyed. Uh, and it, it, I think it indicates his passion in print. People read this. Um, in 93, April 93, the United States Holocaust Memorial uh, Museum opened. He was down there three times within three months. Uh, he was so taken by it, uh, but he also taught a, a course uh, at a seminary down in, in, in DC. And so he took his students there uh, as well as then visiting there again after the course was done. Uh, but but he, said, he said that what he found in the center reinforced what he'd been doing all of these past years. Um, that reinforcement uh, was, increased at the end of the year with the uh, release of Schindler's List. Um, you see Liam Neeson and, and Ralph Fiennes here uh, uh, playing Schindler and uh, concentration camp uh, commandant named uh, Amon Goethe. Uh, this, this film uh, helped trigger a lot of his talks for the next couple of years, actually. Uh, he, he embraced the film, and it, it kind of became the starting point uh, for much of what he talked about over the next two or three years. This was incredibly important for him. Uh, he, often, he often followed his conversations by, uh, by saying that the Holocaust was a unique event, but it was not an aberration. It's not a freak event. It was the first time in, his, in the history of the world that the most developed, most industrialized nation set out to destroy an entire people. And that was important. The core of Chuck's teaching, normally he would give a lecture and he would talk about the history of the Jewish people. He would talk about the background of anti-Semitism. Uh, and then a fairly in-depth descri description of the regime, which included his childhood memories. He could bring his own, his own memories of what he heard. Uh, an understanding that Hitler came to power legally, 
felt it was terribly important to emphasize that. I would suggest that's true today, okay? Uh, that the killers were ordinary people and he would say, just like you and me, just like you and me. Uh, and he said that the Holocaust demonstrates that human beings are capable of doing anything. Uh, his objective was always to ensure, always to ensure that six million Jews that had been murdered would not be forgotten. Uh, education would, was at his core. Uh, in schools, he, he often began, especially with younger students, pupils, uh, he often began with prejudice. He said, every child lives in the proximity of prejudice. It is the best place to start, the best place to start. Um, testimonials, um, and I'll wrap up, I'll wrap up with this. Uh, one fellow, Irving Schwartz, he had, it was amazing that this little, little center, resource center that he had, um, had people coming on field trips. There was a bus from Leominster, Massachusetts that came up to visit his center. Uh, and one fellow who was on the bus wrote afterwards, please let me express my personal thanks for taking time to guide us through your library. I, I put in quotations library. This was, this was a little carol that was packed to the gills at this point, okay? Uh, as one who lost all relatives who were in Europe during the Holocaust, I'm deeply appreciative of you and what you're doing. This, by the way, reminds me of the joy of a historian digging into archives, finding, finding things like this. So I thank you for having this organized. Um, in June of 86, uh, when the Holocaust, or the Association of Holocaust Organizations was founded, founded in New York City uh, in 86, Chuck was there and he was elected to a nine member executive committee. Now, let me tell you that there were 84 Holocaust resource centers in the country at the time. Chuck was the only non-Jew on there, you know, testimonial to his impact. Um, in the summer of, of, uh, of 87, the Jewish Federation of Greater Manchester, uh, now it's the Jew uh, Jewish Federation of New Hampshire, awarded Chuck the funds that were necessary for him to go study at Yad Vashem in Israel. Um, that's a testimony to how much appreciation they had for him. So it's a three week course on teaching the Holocaust. And uh, Chuck says that all it did was uh, emphasize the urgency of his mission in teaching the Holocaust. Um, with the 92 shift back to the library, uh, the center was nine years old at this point, uh, friends made plans to honor Chuck. And I alluded to this right at the very beginning. Um, a tribute committee was arranged um, that was led by uh, Rabbi uh, Barry Krieger and uh, Jay Kahn. And... Uh, they put together uh, uh, an event for a celebration on Sunday, the 26th of April. Um, and it was an open house for the new center because it had just moved back from Fisk Annex. And it was in this lovely place that, uh, that so delighted Chuck. Uh, that evening, they had a $36, $36 plate dinner in the dining commons. Uh, I think some of the money went, not enough, but some of the money went to, to the center. Uh, the keynote speaker was uh, Aaron uh, uh, Staub. Roots of Evil was his book from the University of Massachusetts. And this is where uh, President Sternick uh, welcomed guests, guests by saying that we come to celebrate a person and a place, which is easy for us in this case uh, at Keene State because the Holocaust Center is Chuck Hildebrand. Uh, she then read a special commendation from Governor Judd Gregg. Um, in, uh, in May of 93, Chuck received the first Jonathan Daniels Human Rights Citation. Uh, this was the 25th anniversary of the founding of uh, Jonathan Daniels School. 
Uh, three months later, he flew to Europe uh, as a participant in, in a two-week group visit to sites of the Holocaust. Uh, and this is because he was a member of that council, the executive council. And keep in mind, this is right at the point where the Iron Curtain has come down and the Soviet Union has collapsed. To visit those sites was something nobody could have imagined just a couple of years before. This was really special. Um, let, me, let me just skip over and just end with uh, a letter that was written in 1997. Uh, in 1997, Chuck was already failing. Um, Sandra Lee told me that he'd asked Chuck if he, if he would come to his uh, philosophy course, his ethics course, and talk about the Holocaust. And Chuck said, no, I'm not doing that any longer. Uh, and Chuck was angry, or uh, I'm sorry, Sandra was angry because he'd done that for a number of years and he didn't do it. He didn't know that he was getting ill. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't until 2003 that they uh, formally diagnosed Alzheimer's. Uh, but uh, that last year, he was failing. This letter was written by uh, Jane Alexander and Kelly Budd. They're two teachers at uh, Keene High School, who I'm sure that you, that you knew well. It's, it's a wonderful ending piece, I think, for this. Our introduction to teaching the Holocaust was through Dr. Charles Hildebrand. His own course served as an inspiration to us to incorporate the Holocaust in our ninth grade English class. Not only did Dr. Hildebrand assist us in developing this curriculum, but he also made numerous presentations to our classes. Shortly after Dr. Hildebrand's first presentation, we began to take our students to the center to conduct individual research. Se several even volunteered to staff the center on weekends when it was housed in the basement uh, in a place that resembled the cave. This was no doubt Fiskanix. <laughs> they didn't say that. Each year, the role of, this, of the center expanded further. We borrowed films from the center. Students critiqued them and shared them with other students on the internet. This, this letter was written in 1997. <laughs> uh, the center assisted us in locating speakers. In addition, this past spring, the Holocaust curriculum, which we developed from the center's resources, was accepted by the National Holocaust Museum for inclusion in its instructional, uh, its instructional resources library. This fall, we were asked to present a curriculum to a group of teachers at the New England Association of Teachers of English. Without the continual support of the Keene State College Holocaust Resource Center and its founder, Dr. Charles Hildebrand, we doubt that any of this would have happened. Thank you. <clears throat> When I was asked to do this, Kate wanted me to go to 19, uh, 19, uh, 2007. I couldn't get that far. <laughs> too much to do just on this. Um, I, I become the director in uh, the summer of 1998. Uh, and um, contrary to what uh, Tom said, it didn't take the name um, Center for Holocaust Studies until 2000. Uh, we, I, I didn't mean to make any changes, though I came in with some ideas of things to do. Uh, but I was going to suggest if you have anything that you'd like to ask uh, in Q&A, um, you might want to follow on, well, then what happened after, after this? Because uh, then I could touch upon that. As long as we can answer in eight minutes or less. Eight minutes or less. <laughs> okay, yeah, Kate. Stop at one o'clock. I know, I know you're up there in the sky somewhere. <laughs> yeah, so if anybody in the room has something. Uh, and if for folks who, I mean, if you need to leave, that's that's fine. Don't leave. Yeah. So then what? Yeah, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. I'm glad you asked. Yeah. Um, I I did. It, I I totally honor Chuck. He's he he is the foundation stone of everything that you see. There's absolutely no question. I I never never shared his passion in the same way. I wonder if Judy's wife ever saw him for several of these years, and uh, uh, Mark probably had to ask, "Who's my father?" Is his son, because uh, he was he was so focused on this. Um, I decided.
to create what, what we called at the time um, the Holocaust Resource Center Advisory Board. And Bob Golden, who was the vice president for academic affairs at the time, uh, is the one who asked me this. And I said, I, I, want, I want to create this and I want it to be at both college and non-college people. Now, Chuck never did that because when he did that tour of all of these centers, at least one director told him, don't lose control of what you're doing. Don't have other people get involved in what you're doing. And he took that to heart. Uh, and, and to me, that was a mistake. And I, I would suggest that so much of what then happened was a result of having people who were very engaged in the subject come around a table and discuss where we're going to go next. Uh, and it involved, it involved some wonderful people both on and off campus. Uh, some of the people on campus then got involved in developing a minor in Holocaust studies just a couple of years later. Uh, off campus, I probably don't need to mention this, uh, given the name Cohen, uh, uh, I asked Jan if she would join the group uh, in the fall of 1999. And one of the first things that she did, she had a daughter in middle school at the time, and there were some problems going on in the middle school with uh, people disparaging other people, and there seemed to be an element of prejudice. As it, it, and and Jan, Jan said, you know, there's a, there's a, a crystal knocked remembrance coming up. Why don't we do it here? And we formed a committee with Jim Day, uh, who was the principal of the middle school, and we got uh, children that could, children from the from the middle school involved in this and. And it turned out to be our first crystal knock remembrance of the middle school, which we continued to do until the facility was condemned a few years later, and it ended up going then to the Colonial Theater. Uh, but uh, that wouldn't have happened without, and, it, and it, it's not just Jan. I mean, there were other people, Reverend, Reverend Hom from, uh, from the church. He actually printed off all of the programs for that event, uh, and he was a member of the advisory group at the time. And certain people came up with ideas for people to come in as speakers. And uh, one day, um, Bob Golden called me, and it was right after I had gone to a two-week institute at Northwestern on the Holocaust. Um, and it was an institution which focused on film and the Holocaust and literature of the Holocaust and other subjects besides history. And it helped open my eyes to the fact that this could be a multidisciplinary program of some sort. And Bob Golden called me and said, what do you think of the idea of creating a major or minor record? And I said, uh, I said, I have some ideas who could teach some of the courses, but why don't you call it so it, it's in the vice president's office as opposed to my office? And he did. And uh, Nona Feinberg and Larry Benequist and Sandra Lee uh, and Teresa Siebert and, uh, and a few others came over. This became truly a multidisciplinary effort that involved faculty from all over campus. It was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful. And at a meeting a couple of years later out at Wilson Pond at the college camp, not Wilson, is it Wilson Pond at the college camp? Yeah. Um, we were, we were, this was a retreat and Larry Benequist said, uh, I didn't anticipate this, you shouldn't stop at a minor, you should create a major. Now, he created the major in film studies here, so he kind of knew what he was talking about. Jan was at that meeting, and she took me aside, and she said, what would we need to do to do that? Um, and I said, I can't be the chair of a program and also the director of the center, uh, so we'd have to get somebody else to either take my place here or the, and I knew I wanted to go uh, and teach full time. Um, but I said, I don't think a major in Holocaust studies uh, is good enough. And so we went through a discussion. We talked about Holocaust and Jewish studies. We ended up going with Holocaust and, and, and genocide studies. Uh, and that meant hiring somebody else. Uh, although Teresa Siebert taught, uh, uh, she, she was very engaged already in Rwanda and was also doing stuff with, uh, um, with Cambodia. And so she taught a course on sociology of genocide. Um, we needed somebody that could devote more time to that. And so that happens in 08, 09. And I'd already left the center uh, by that point. 
And I was, I, in fact, I coordinated the development of the major and then, and then chaired the program when it started. So some major things, but I, I, I honestly don't believe that some of that would have happened um, had I not had this group that was constantly coming up with ideas. What, what, what else might we do? In fact, it got to be a little too much, <laughs> I thought, especially towards the end. Um, we had a lot of students that were already declaring a minor. And they created their own organization, um, um, an awareness group for, for Holocaust and genocide studies, um, and got very active, very good students. We had some very good students, a lot of them. Um, but that's that's how it evolved. And but but you had to plant the seed and there had to be, you know, who was there and was yeah. Chuck's like goal um, of like the building in the curriculum, like for like the Holocaust studies, or was it for like genocide studies in general? No, he would he was single-minded in his focus on the Holocaust. He really was. Um, there was a student body president in 85, 86 uh, who got very engaged in uh, the issue of apartheid in South Africa. Uh, and he he actually had a march that started on Appian Way and went all the way up uh, uh, to Central Square. And he approached Chuck, and Chuck was incredibly sympathetic. But when he asked him if he would also get involved in this, he said, no. He said, my, my focus is, I think to some degree, he realized how restricted his resources were and his time. And this is what he was going to do. Uh, I do not know if Chuck were around today, if he would have liked the fact that we had broadened it uh, the way we did. Um, he felt it was enough to do just in dealing with the Holocaust. And given the anti Semitism that we're seeing in our world today, um, we might have been justified. Well, we're going to, we got, there's your eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming.